Uh, my name is Jason. My name is Jason Macy, the Chief Technology Officer with Forum Systems, and I'm joined with our collaboration partner, uh, uh, Steve Vincent from TIAG, who's our integration partner for U.S. initiatives and zero trust. And uh, today's uh, uh, demonstration uh, is going to uh, basically uh, follow the agenda presentation outline as provided by um, Bay ATARC with a company in product introduction. Talk about the Zero Trust uh, architecture and uh, NIST special publication 800-207 and really focus then in on our product technology, the Forum Sentry, uh, Zero Trust Policy Enforcement Point, uh, go into the features and the architecture and some of the characteristic uh, differentiators that our product technology provides uh, in the solution space of Zero Trust. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about legacy modernization and how our technology helps facilitate the adoption of zero trust uh, architectures with minimal effort and minimal disruption. And uh, follow up with the second portion of today's uh, presentation, which is the live lab demonstrations, um, where we'll be focused uh, for uh, our effort uh, in, uh, today on the scenarios one, five through nine and discussions of the 10 through 12. Um, Steve is going to monitor the chat while I uh, go ahead and, and talk through and, and provide the demonstration. So feel free to ask questions as we go through uh, using the chat and Steve will do his best to answer those uh, as we go along. Uh, and of course, uh, we will, uh, as Kirsten said, have at the end a uh, question and answer session for as long as uh, people want to stay and ask uh, and have further uh, discussions. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, kick it off here. Uh, so just a quick background for uh, who we are, Forum, uh, Forum Systems. Uh, we've actually been around for quite a number of years. Uh, our product technology is deployed in uh, governments uh, and agencies in uh, a commercial uh, realm uh, worldwide. Uh, we've had a core focus since inception on uh, areas around API security, zero trust, identity access control, uh, really focused on the combination of identity and data security, dynamic data security, um, as the fundamental foundational components of our uh, solution approaches and technology. We have gone through various government certifications with this product technology, FIPS 140-2, Common Criteria Network Device Protection Profile, DOD PKI, and we'll talk about how that's important relative to the uh, deployment spectrum and, and, and comfort uh, around the technology itself relative to its uh, security, uh, in addition to the features, of course, that we provide in that space. Um, we will talk about that modernization aspect, hybrid cloud adoption, uh, the, the notion in these scenarios actually call them out quite nicely as far as the really hybrid uh, necessity of on-prem technology talking to the cloud or vice versa, and how we can bridge a lot of legacy technologies to help them participate in the uh, ultimate modernization for zero trust principles and architecture. Uh, we do have good accolades out there, and I'll talk about uh, as we go along in the uh, presentation today, a couple of our uh, um, deployments uh, that in the US government. Uh, and UK government where uh, for all of our product deployments that we've had, uh, we have 100% deployment success and the product has never been compromised in the history of any deployment. That's a testament really to the foundational aspects of this technology, which is rooted in security. Uh, security first has always been our principle. These are the uh, foundational uh, characteristics of the architecture of the product technology. We'll see that as we go through some of the underlying uh, engines and capabilities that are, that are built in. Uh, but this really is the foundational differentiator because we're going to focus today on policy enforcement points. That is really where we play in the zero trust architecture and those, that is the central core to ensuring um, not only the principles of zero trust policy enforcement, but also that the PEP, PEP itself is not able and subject to uh, be compromised. And so that's really going to be what our, our focus is today, is looking at the, uh, the NIST special publication 800-207 uh, around the, the policy enforcement point. Of course, it calls out uh, zero trust architecture uh, as, as sort of a uh, necessity to provide granular uh, capability around identity and access control enforcement for data and services. 
um, with policy decisions and most importantly, policy enforcement to ensure that those uh, communication uh, exchanges are uh, adhere to the information assurance rules uh, that are uh, set forth. And what that, of course, does is it eliminates these uh, legacy architecture concepts of uh, of of you know trusted ecosystems where you've got a, a bunch of computers internally that don't have any controls or capabilities to uh, to to vet or ensure uh, that a particular instance gets compromised and can't compromise other instances within within those zones and so it is those uh, policy enforcement point is going to be the focal point of our discussion today because that is what we uh, forum systems provide is the forum century product that is the cyber secure uh, policy enforcement point. What does that mean? Well, that means that we've built this technology with uh, security in mind. So a secure lockdown OS built in PKI, built in encryption around all the policy artifacts the agents for all identity uh, integrations are built in, so you don't have to have any adapters or uh, or, or agents uh, deployed within your infrastructure. Uh, the performance, as uh, we'll talk about in more detail, from a throughput uh, and, and low, low latency, high uh, transaction throughput, and the integrity of the instance itself verified through self-help integrity uh, of the uh, actual instance. These are the, the foundational aspects of our technology uh, that we then uh, ultimately deliver the features and functions uh, on top of it. So this is the crux of our um, discussion around taking these various uh, components and systems within the ecosystem of traditional architecture and bringing them together uh, sensibly in a, uh, a seamless age for the cyber secure policy enforcement, ID management, PKI, data access, SIEM, all these pieces come together and we'll showcase that um, in the demonstration today, uh, how that works. I think you're somebody. Sorry, if, this, uh, if one of the... Uh, so, uh, go, go, Paul, are you able to mute your microphone, please? Thank you. So one of the key aspects of our uh, technology approach is also being able to deploy in any uh, computing ecosystem. Obviously in the modern uh, era, there's a lot of different types of uh, environments in which we want to uh, have zero trust principles enforced and being able to adapt to any uh, computing ecosystem, whether it be an on-prem traditional or a cloud or a hybrid, uh, approach, a microservices approach. Um, all of these are necessary as far as having the ability to be uh, versatile in terms of deploying um, the instance base PEPs to su support these initiatives. And so we've gone ahead and made sure that our technology is versatile as well relative to its form factors and the ability to uh, deploy in, 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 in virtually any computing environment. Now, one of the keys as far as what I've talked about you know, up to this point is the security aspect of the product architecture. And now we're gonna to try to change it into the policies and the capability set that deliver to business and agencies and organizations to achieve the zero trust capabilities. Uh, so within that security architecture uh, and product instances is the capabilities, the engines, if you will, that uh, provide for the um, data security and, 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 and protocol and, and, and other things. So it, it really kind of falls into three categories. Uh, the network layer allows the PEP to connect different systems together. So we've got various uh, types of protocol adapters that allow for different systems to communicate uh, seamlessly through the policy enforcement point by way of uh, adhering to and facilitating the protocol connections and the security uh, provisions on those protocols. But really where it gets uh, much more interesting and important is at the data level. Uh, what we call the application level, where we've got engines on board to do things like malware, intrusion, data leakage, schema validation, authentication, authorization at the data level, uh, transformation, throttling, encryption, signing. So a lot of ways to ensure that the communication exchanges that are going on adhere to the policies 
through the um, rigid inspection and analysis and enforcement at the data level, in addition to the protocol level, using user information with the data uh, as uh, dynamic capabilities uh, as, as information flows uh, back and forth. Another key aspect is the logging and visibility. As I'll show you, one of the great things about uh, zero trust architecture and the PEP concept is it not only centralizes flows through uh, the policy enforcement points for, uh, for enforcement, it also gives the visibility of what's actually going on on your network. And we'll showcase how our product uh, contextualizes all that information to have uh, very uh, granular visibility into the communication exchanges going on in your network and give much, much more uh, visibility into the actual um, auditing and the communication exchange. So we've designed this product technology to be very simple to deploy. Literally, it's instance-based, uh, no third-party dependencies or anything. You can deploy instances of Sentry literally within minutes. Uh, and a lot of our new use cases out there in industry are elastic-based, uh, cloud-based, on-demand, computing-based, where uh, the, the, the policy templates and the instances themselves are spun up on demand uh, with no human intervention. So it's a very versatile, agile way to deploy these capabilities without uh, significant impact to your existing uh, environment. Uh, this is a big, big part of really our focal point of uh, adoption of zero trust architecture is the minimal impact on uh, the existing systems. It's not a rip and replace, redesign of, uh, of legacy systems. Uh, we can achieve zero trust principles without doing that. Uh, and it's really uh, an advantage to the ability to adopt these principles again, without having to rework uh, you know, a legacy and old systems and things of that manner. And so part of the aspects here are reusable policies. We've got hundreds of pre-built templates. Most of these cases we've already done in many, many other customer sites. We bring all that to bear in a, in a, in a template library that can be brought in. So your flows are already uh, uh, easily provisioned and, and, and modified to the use case in question. Everything with our product technology, all the different flows, you have hundreds of different flows all active at the same time. Each one, if you want to alter or change a flow, it's all a hot swappable on demand. There's never any downtime for business continuity or anything of that nature. And of course, it goes across all the variants of the uh, form factors so that it's a unified way of, uh, of provisioning and, and deploying policies for the, the policy enforcement uh, capabilities. Digging just a little bit deeper because it's important to say, state uh, around the capabilities of data security and identity access control means the technology needs to go deeper. And in many cases, uh, you, 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 you may hear policy enforcement points as kind of just this uh, sort of access control point. It's, it's much more than that. It needs to be continuous authentication. It needs to be continuous inspection. Uh, it needs to take all the uh, considerations of the transport security, the message security, the potential threat vectors, again, uh, in, in, in the use case here, depending on where the device or system is located or the user's coming from, there may be a higher threat profile to have to focus on. Uh, the integrity, the capability of, uh, of doing uh, signing and verification or encryption and decryption and marrying that with the identity, the multi-factor authentication capabilities to identify not only a user, a trusted user, but also marry that with the information exchange that that user system or device is sending and receiving. That's the key, marrying those two together. Uh, our ability to do all of this within uh, this technology uh, product instance uh, policy enforcement point allows for great simplification of, uh, of the architecture, uh, small footprint, uh, no coding, easy to, easy to deploy, easy to pr provision. In addition, from a legacy perspective, we'll talk a bit more about that, where you've got the translation capabilities built in, where we can actually modify message patterns on the fly to adapt to legacy infrastructure, but present uh, a modernized zero trust uh, uh, applicable uh, communication point uh, on, on the front side. 
Additionally, from a visibility perspective, machine learning AI is a big uh, innovation uh, aspect. We've built our logging to support uh, machine learning format. We contextualize all the information exchange. We'll see that in the demo today around the contextual aspect of logging and the visibility that this technology gives you around what's actually going on on the network. As far as what we call agentless identity, it's a big, it's a big uh, uh, important piece of the equation because in traditional IAM and, and deployments, you've got agents and adapters strewn all about, very difficult to manage, very difficult to uh, maintain. Uh, with us, basically, we've built them all in. We literally integrate with virtually every single uh, identity vendor out there. Uh, from a multi-factor uh, authentication in the modern uh, SaaS IDM world to you know, cloud-based, on-prem, you know, traditional LDAP, Active Directory, database-based uh, 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 adapters, all built in. So you don't have to actually deploy any agents or adapters to achieve integration, single sign-on, federation, multi-factor authentication. Simply uh, provision the adapter and you have uh, instant connectivity for a simplification, again, on bringing identity into the policy enforcement point equation for not only a, a continuous authentication assurance, but also that uh, ability to do that in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that does not impose um, changes on the infrastructure and services that you're accessing. Talk quickly about the AI logging, and we'll see this a little more as we go along in the demo, but this is a key to what we do as the policy enforcement point, uh, ensuring that continuous inspection and analysis of policies and information and authentication. We're also tracking all the latency characteristics so that you have full visibility across all your systems and services of exactly the timing uh, considerations of the uh, uh, transaction sequences. Uh, all again, formatted down and distilled down to simple um, contextualized AI formats that pull in all of the metadata properties of every client server communication exchange, uh, anything that goes to the cloud or on-prem, anything in the modern world adheres all to these effective principles of uh, the uh, base properties of communication. We distill all of this down and contextualize it all into unique session identifiers for every transaction and provide that in a logging format that gives uh, unparalleled visibility into the communication exchange um, as, as a component of uh, our capability. So that's just a quick overview of the architecture. The, one of the things obviously in terms of the uh, questions that were posed for this initiative were, you know, please provide what you know, kind of additional technologies beyond, uh, beyond yours that's required to support the use cases uh, in question. Uh, obviously, we're not going to go through all the use cases today in the interest of time, but I did want to showcase for each of those what really uh, is the central theme of our technology, which is you, 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 don't, you don't need other pieces of technology. There's no third party dependencies that we require. We're completely vendor agnostic. We can integrate with virtually any other component within a network architecture stack and ecosystem. So the key to our approach is kind of, a, you know, be the Switzerland of technology, no vendor uh, specific lock, complete sta open standards based adoption, uh, integrate with what you have in order to facilitate the modernization and capabilities of zero trust. And so this really goes through each and all of these uh, concepts, whether you're on a, a, an on-prem network talking to the cloud or whether you're in a satellite office uh, with, uh, you know, with either you know, good, uh, proper, good, reliable connectivity. Uh, we do have also provisions for when it's not very reliable connectivity. So there's onboard caching capabilities, there's redundancy and failover capabilities built in to help facilitate uh, scenarios where the um, that's the bandwidth is low or the connectivity is, uh, is is unreliable. Again, these are capabilities that are built into the technology itself and not uh, requiring uh, other additional capabilities. And hey, Jason, so really, a, Jason, jump in with a question real quick. Question is, have you implemented this system on an IP, IPv4 plus IPv6 or an IPv6 only for a client? Uh, absolutely, Steve. Yes. Uh, I, I, in fact, it's quite common for it to be uh, either, uh, you know, changed to IPv6 completely. Uh, oftentimes it's IPv4, IPv6. 
uh, a lot of the Amazon stuff now is IPv6 uh, specific and Azure in the cloud. Um, but absolutely. So the technology is IPv4 and IPv6 compliant, and um, we have environments that are IPv4 exclusive, more legacy there, uh, IPv6 for the more modern uh, uh, sort of greenfield initial in initiatives. But yes, fu fully supportive of, of both of those TCP uh, IP stack capabilities. Got it. Uh, so th that's really the crux of this part of it, which was kind of a showcase the um, really what the, what is necessary. And of course, in each of these cases, depending on the topology, if we're talking into the cloud, we're going to have a cloud virtual instance out in the cloud. If we're on prem, you can choose from the ver variety of different uh, form factors, the you know the purpose built uh, hardware or the the virtualization uh, form factors as as sort of indicative of the particulars of the uh, environment and, and, and the points of connection, if you will, um, relative to that. But ultimately, uh, the takeaway here is we don't need anything else. It's a built-in. Uh, we, as I'll showcase in the demo today, we certainly use other components and integrate with other systems for for, for MFA purposes or for role-based analysis or for like a geo lookup, we'll, we'll do that kind of uh, those integrations to utilize other systems and services to bring to bear. But those are all based on the embedded capabilities to connect, adapt, and enhance um, without requiring other technologies to do it. So let's take a look at the capability uh, model for uh, the Zero Trust, which uh, again, it was one of the template asks for this uh, demonstration is how do we map to that capability model? So uh, we went through and analyzed all these areas and these are you know, sort of core areas of our, uh, our capabilities that we've got uh, deployments out there in industry uh, across each of these uh, scenarios uh, for data loss, data encryption, data masking, data tagging, Obviously, API integrations, a uh, big one for us, encrypted traffic, uh, common uh, access points, uh, clouds access security, application proxy, reverse and forward. Uh, I'll show, show a lot of this today. In fact, I try to incorporate a lot of these in our demo just so you can see you know, a, good, a good amount of these in, in, in actually the demo today. User authentication, authorization, uh, privilege access management, uh, multi-factor, ABAC, key management, Key management is another very important aspect of our PKI is all centralized. You don't have to manage key stores across all different instances. It's central key management. Um, AI, AI ML uh, logging formats, the monitoring and auditing and integration with uh, SIEM. And uh, we are standards based across uh, a, a vers versatile set of uh, virtually any API uh, standard that exists out there, we uh, we have we have built in because we, that's kind of our, our one of our core aspects is API security. So we've got to support all of the API variants and standards that exist in industry. So the green represents what's built in. It's a it's a it's a pretty broad swath of capabilities. And obviously, in the case of zero trust, it's a combination of technologies that delivers the whole vision uh, at the device endpoint uh, and, and orchestration and things of that nature. Uh, but it's a pretty uh, uh, broad spectrum of capability delivered in, in, a, in, a, in one uh, product technology that we, uh, we, we will showcase uh, many of these uh, in, in today's demo. Um, I did want to talk and touch upon the concept of the legacy migration and backward compatibility. This is a big piece that we see with, uh, with, with, with customers trying to move toward uh, these new uh, architectural principles, zero trust obviously being uh, an important one uh, relative to how to take existing uh, environments and systems that are legacy in nature and, and, and modernize them. And in many cases, that could be a very daunting task because obviously you've got uh, a lot of business continuity necessities to those systems. You can't just take them down and move them, redesigning them is huge cost. And so how is it done? Well, it's done by the provisions uh, set forth here, which we do all the time in industry, uh, taking and presenting a modernized API front, modernized communication front to a legacy system through the capabilities that we provide around the protocol translation, the user authentication uh, with the agents built in on board, virtualization of the API, uh, conversion of message formats, things like SOAP to RAS or XML to JSON or you know, different XML to different XML or structured languages, 
um, obviously providing the protocol, the more, you know, uh, NIST, uh, FIPS ciphers, uh, TLS, you know, 1.2, SHA-2 ciphers that the legacy app may not be able to support based on its, uh, you know, its, its uh, capabilities and the transformation of the content and the headers and the information exchange allows for a seamless apparent uh, modernized representation in front of the application. You don't have to change the application to achieve this. You simply utilize technology design to do it for you as an abstraction layer, which is a PEP is exactly what a PEP is. It's the abstraction layer in front of the applications that you're uh, enforcing the policy, seamless abstraction layer. It's meant to be not known it's even there, which I'll showcase uh, uh, as far as uh, how you know, ultimately that PEPs that you talk to every day, probably and you go to your bank or you file your taxes, you, you don't know you're talking not to the backend infrastructure, you're actually talking to policy enforcement points. So the abstraction is designed by intent through this architecture principle to abstract it from the application. And it also facilitates then the means to do much more simple legacy um, modernization initiatives without having to go back and, and reinvent the systems and architectures. So a couple other points uh, in, in reference to uh, the, the, the talking about sustainability as far as how easy this product is to deploy and maintain. Uh, I've obviously talked about the no dependencies aspect, provisioning templates, silent install. You know, literally instances can be deployed in minutes. You provision the hardware within you know under an hour. Uh, it's very simple. It's very designed to be simple. It's that's how we've you know done this for years. Is try to make it uh, very easy for our customers to do and utilize this technology. It's all point and click. You've got hundreds of task workflows built in. Uh, for policies that are, you know, uh, sort of known uh, uh, aspects and you can build your own and reuse them based on, uh, again, kind of the reusable principles of identity access control, multi-factor auth, data security, uh, all of those things become uh, common to how you want to enforce uh, various scenarios. And so therefore having it be reusable is, is key. The built-in adapters, no agents that are adapters or, or, or to deploy on endpoints. Uh, administration is simple as far as upgrading and hot swappable policies and intuitive uh, nature. So uh, very low impact to administer and sustain this technology. Uh, it's not coding. You don't have to learn any new coding languages. You don't have to learn how to integrate adapters, any of that stuff. It's just simple deploy and provision uh, and you're up and running. From a performance perspective, this is a key question I get all the time as far as that policy enforcement point and, uh, you know, is it a, is it a degradation uh, a potential of throughput capability? Uh, and the answer is no, and the answer is no for many number of reasons. I'm explaining them uh, as far as purpose-built technology. So we're not like an integration toolkit. We're not, uh, you know, an open a coding platform. This is a highly tuned product technology with crypto acceleration, tuned network TCP throughput, what we call a one pass data funnel that compiles all your policies so that you're applying it once as the information flows, the request and response patterns so that it's significant low sub, sub millisecond latency, high, high thousands of TPS volume. Uh, intelligent caching to have IO reduction on uh, calls, for example, to identity servers or, uh, or other infrastructure components uh, or API calls, uh, load balancing to help facilitate uh, 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 balancing across uh, um, backend systems and failover strategies, and also the ability to see exactly what the performance profile is of your network because we capture it all and present it to you. Um, through those seven segments of latency capture across every um, aspect of the communication exchange from client to sentry, from sentry to back end, back end, back to sentry, sentry back to client, all the pieces of its internal and as well as the identity system call that gives you your seventh segment, all contextualized and provided in an AI learning format. So for advanced heuristics learning and, and hotspot detection, you can use uh, AI ML engines to inspect and uh, analyze that information. So high contextualization around that. 
What's another big differentiator? Cost, okay? We do this much different than anybody else in industry does this, okay? We're not a toolkit. We don't charge by user. We don't charge by API or service. We charge by instance. An instance of Sentry, a policy enforcement point is an instance. You can you know, support uh, various uh, licensing models. Most common is a subscription model. And the key here is because there's no coding, because it's all instance based, you can have as many users, as many services, uh, systems that you can push through. Um, and so it's dramatic reduction in cost and in complexity because of how we do it. And, and we do it much different than anybody else uh, for that very reason, to make it simple, elegant, uh, and frictionless to deploy uh, and, and to maintain. So just a quick uh, example of the pedigree that we have out there. Again, we've been doing this a long time in industry. Um, so a couple of high profile ones I'll talk a little deeper about. All the electronic tax filings in the US are terminated at uh, irs.gov. That's forum sentry uh, providing that uh, security for, uh, for the US Treasury. All the weather feeds for the FAA in the United States uh, is secured through forum sentry. Uh, all your T-Mobile phones globally are provisioned through Forum Sentry. About 60% of the world's credit card transactions are secured through Forum Sentry. So we've got deployments in the energy sector and the healthcare sector. Talk a little bit about our UK uh, deployments, specifically around biometrics, but ultimately government commercial deployments, high, high profile, high um, uh, mission criticality, uh, very highly tested and proven technology deployments uh, across uh, across the world. I'll, I'll go in a little more depth before we kick over to the demo relative to the uh, kind of couple flagship ones, obviously modernization and e-file. I know everybody's favorite topic is taxes, but obviously for us, it's an important distinction to make sure we're doing the right thing and making sure the U.S. government gets their revenue stream. The electronic tax filing to uh, e-file was actually uh, successfully uh, achieved back uh, in 2005 uh, to basically transform the United States into an e-file system. Um, we've been the technology behind that since inception. And the keys is that it's evolved over time to help facilitate more modernized ways of communicating, but ultimately, uh, the provisions of zero trust that we talk about, uh, you know, uh, data validation, data inspection, uh, signatures and encryption for integrity and, uh, and, and, and obfuscation, uh, the, the ability to do multi-factor authentication. So those taxes come in, they're actually coming in in a encrypted zip payload uh, with uh, a security uh, authentication on the actual uh, two-way uh, TLS, then that this PKI cert is then married to a user, which is then checked to an actual artifact that is inside of an encrypted message that comes across. So we call it multi-context authentication, where not only are we doing multiple factors, we're also marrying that uh, the proven identity to the data. Um, so it really uh, does encompass a lot of what we see as the principles of zero trust architectures, what we're doing from a, a, a heavy lift at that uh, policy enforcement point, which is the first point of contact. Of course, you don't know you're talking to Sentry. You probably have maybe have never even heard of Forum Sentry, but that is what's doing uh, the entire uh, US tax return security. Similarly, uh, every time you may have traveled to the UK uh, and gone through uh, the border checks uh, or uh, any biometric information actually in the UK government is all served through their central uh, UK uh, Home Office of Biometrics. Home Office is like the US equivalent of the uh, Department of Homeland Security. And what they decided is all this biometric information is very sensitive, so we need to consolidate it through into the one agency and provide a means to have all of the other agencies and organizations uh, across the UK uh, communicate securely through that central hub. And uh, so that is also secured and uh, provided by Forum Sentry across, uh, you know, over 20 biometric uh, security information formats, 50 APIs, 120 million biometric records, 85 million identities. Again, same principles of data security, 
um, uh, data integrity, authentication, uh, providing, as we'll showcase today in the demo, a couple of you know, different ways in which to access the same information, but, but potentially from different sources that may be less trusted and thus require more vetting uh, and, and perhaps have uh, a reduced set of information that they can, they can actually see. But a couple of examples of really you know, high, high profile cases that we're out there doing this uh, each and every day. Uh, but again, as a silent component of the infrastructure, exactly what a PEP should be, not a, a front and center disrupting mechanism, but rather a seamless component that's doing the, the heavy lifting uh, as a seamless aspect of the communication exchange. Jason, a question came up with respect to the T-Mobile uh, deployment reference, and then they had a high profile breach. And the question is, what if any role was form sentry did form sentry play in that event? None whatsoever. Yeah, no, we, it, it wasn't a part of the provisioning. So we do the uh, mobile provisioning. The T-Mobile breach was on cust customer facing portal of which we have no technology whatsoever. So we are in the provisioning path. So if you go to a provider and you get your phone, the provisioning uh, of that phone uh, actually goes through the authentication uh, and, 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 and that process. That's the piece we play uh, at T-Mobile, but no, that breach has absolutely nothing to do with us. It is interesting with a lot of these customers because um, you know, breaches are often, you know, maybe associated and, and thus give bad press. Uh, I'll give a good example of a breach that did happen many years back with the Heartbleed uh, for um, the uh, Canadian uh, Revenue Service. And in that case, the uh, Canadian Revenue Service shut down for six days. Um, we maintained uh, our capability because we weren't so subject to, uh, susceptible to heart bleed and were able to keep uh, no, no downtime. Again, 100% deployment success product has never been compromised in any, in any deployment ever, mm -hmm. uh, including T-Mobile, IRS and, and, and UK and various of the others in the FAA, et cetera. So, you know, that's kind of the first portion to give kind of an overlay of the technology capabilities. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot of uh, obviously to fit into the, the time frame we have. So, uh, but hopefully gives you an encapsulation of the capabilities. Now uh, we can kind of go to the second portion of today's session, which is focusing in on the actual demonstration use cases and having a look a little deeper into how the product technology provides these capabilities uh, and, and, and uh, enforces the uh, communication flows. So to support uh, today's uh, uh, demo, we've got kind of several pieces uh, of uh, uh, the puzzle to showcase the actual communication. So in, in our case, we're demonstrating policy enforcement point, right? So policy enforcement point does what? It basically uh, facilitates the communication between a, uh, a client and an application uh, in, uh, in, a, in a manner that obviously is meant to be seamless uh, and showcases that. Now, it, as a policy enforcement point, it's actually, uh, you know, maybe not as uh, e easily and glamorous as, uh, you know, like an app on a, on a phone to showcase. So, uh, I'm going to talk through kind of these flows. We'll walk through the, the policies and kind of showcase it. But by intent, these things are meant to happen kind of seamless and frictionless to the user. As, and as you'll see, it does. You won't, if we were just showing the user portion of this, you'd never know uh, a sentry's there doing the, 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 the heavy lift. But so we'll, we'll, we'll dig into all of that um, relative to how it works. Uh, so really for the two scenarios, first one being the client uh, accessing a cloud application. Um, we'll be focusing on um, using uh, our policy enforcement point for that. Same policy enforcement point with a different policy set we'll use for the other flow, a um, couple of flows actually, uh, which is the, um, the fingerprint uh, use cases, uh, which are the five through nine use cases and we'll go in more detail, um, where we have a a simulated client that can simulate information that a client would send to a fingerprint application. And we also have a simulated fingerprint application that will respond with a biometric fingerprint. Uh, and then I'll be just using uh, 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 for my client to access that cloud will just come be coming from uh, uh, the, the office here. Um, so that's kind of the setup. 
So this is the point where I'll, I'll try to kind of kick over to back and forth, uh, if you will, to the um, uh, to the product interface to showcase some of these kind of concepts around like how do we, you know, identify and uh, and and, care, and and classify, for example, users uh, and how they're authenticated, and then sort of what kind of you know uh, levels of classification do we give based upon that. Now, um, as we go through the demo, I'll showcase this more uh, specifically around the flows. Uh, one of the keys is, is that our integration adapters allow us to you know, integrate with various MFA providers, Octaduo, and then you know, all the different social media ones and various other ones. We've also got multi-factor capability built in uh, and the capabilities that go to like LDAP, Active Directory, and PKI authentication, and we'll show a lot of that. Um, but it's a, it's a good uh, uh, point now to really, I think, to just to kind of get a quick glimpse at the policies and the interface uh, for Forum Sentry. So I'm going to go out here to our Forum Sentry instance, um, which has a, the administration interface uh, to log into. And we can uh, take a quick uh, look through how effectively the the policies and the information is sort of presented here from uh, actually uh, you know, performing the uh, use cases. So the, the interface is broken down into uh, various components here. Uh, you got sort of a diagnostic uh, aspect, which is where we'll go to you know, look at our logging. We can hook into SNMP. We can hook into syslog. Uh, obviously, from a statistical analysis, uh, analytics analysis uh, of, of information, uh, that that's where you know we would come under the diagnostic section. Um, under the gateway section is where we build our connectivity, like our, our protocol policies, how we connect different systems or allow systems to connect to the PEP in order to again provide that sort of seamless uh, interface to the to the applications. The content policies uh, for how we, you know, want to intercept and, and you know uh, apply uh, constraints on the on the message format, our workflows, redirects. We'll talk about that as for authentication, our PKI for keys, and our uh, various ways our security policies. And I'll, I'll have a couple examples today around TLS two way as well as dynamic response encryption of fingerprint data that we'll come back and have a look under here. Intrusion detection, uh, basically block, throttle, quarantine, uh, based on different uh, characteristic detection of, an, of intrusion attacks. Our adapters to go to um, different uh, identity systems and setting up access controls for users, hosts, IPs, or ZACMO-based uh, domain and role-based administration. And then some of the aspects of the system relative to global device provisioning, uh, import, export, uh, things of that nature, networking. That's kind of how the interface is broken up, okay? So going back to our uh, looking at um, some of the different characteristics of how, um, how to basically authenticate. Um, so as we're going to go through our demonstration today, I've built a policy here for our cloud application that allows us to basically have a, an ability to access that um, cloud application with various uh, different kinds of authentication adapters um, to utilize. So like maybe a two-factor auth with Okta or a, a user Google login or, or, or uh, you know, maybe a Facebook login. Obviously, those are more not generally used as much as government agencies. They are in the commercial realm, but capabilities if you want to enable them. As examples, uh, we focused today just because uh, it, from a simplicity of showing some of the aspects of role uh, on the, we'll do an LDAP authentication for our access point. And it's that way we can show the user privilege piece and I can kind of talk through all of that. But ultimately this is the policy that, uh, that will do that. And we'll come back and, and showcase how that kind of uh, goes back to kind of taking what kind of authentication happened and, and classifying that accordingly. Similarly, um, the role analysis uh, that we talk about here relative to, you know, where, uh, you know, what, what type of user is this, okay? Um, so lots of ways to do this. I'll show, I'll show two of them in the demo today. 
uh, you know, one from uh, retrieving that information from uh, LDAP or Active Directory as the attribute role of the authenticated user, uh, and another use case for the fingerprint. I'll show how that can also be done with uh, role information that comes back, uh, you know, from uh, you know, from either um, you know our own um, uh, multi-factor authentication provider, right. or like in integrating with one like an Octa or something like that, where we get a SAML or an OAuth token back, and using the role information provided therein to make the policy decisions or provide that information. Um, the policies based on deployment location. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. I'll talk uh, again about this as we go along, but ultimately we have this concept called uh, IP access control, where we have uh, and can define different regions of where uh, clients are connecting in from. Um, one of the examples I'll show in our in our subsequent uh, demo is the range of allowable where the client uh, can actually uh, request uh, the fingerprint information and how we lock that down to the PKI and the user credential all together with that network. But these classifications can be defined and the policies can be dynamic so that you can have the same application. This is the key. The same application, I'll show two examples of it, like the fingerprint application, same exact application, not changing it at all. We're simply putting the layer of security on the front side and altering that security based on uh, the conditions of either where the user is coming from, maybe trusted, untrusted, how that user was authenticated. Um, all of those things are dynamically applicable and to the same exact service. And that's, I think, the spirit of what we were looking at as far as what these, um, these scenarios are, are calling for. Similarly, classifying uh, the device. So you know, we can look at many different aspects of the inbound communication in terms of the fact that the, set, the PEP looks at and inspects this communication pattern at the, at, uh, all the way down to the uh, application level. So we look at the headers, we look at the body, we look at the information at the protocol level, source IP. So all of these uh, pieces can be utilized to determine and, uh, and, and, uh, and classify um, the source. Obviously, in, in conjunction with that, if there are uh, uh, provisions that were uh, done on in, in technology running on those endpoint systems that can provide that, um, that, that those inspection criteria, we can utilize that as well as it comes in. So things like, um, you know, classifying, uh, for example, here, I'll bring up my uh, TASIS group here around the uh, source device classifications and basically all kinds of different ways that we can utilize to detect, you know, what kind of information's coming in and then give a, a, a set of risk classification to that of, you know, high, low, medium or whatnot based upon what varying criteria we want to utilize. So here uh, as an example, you know, we can use uh, a request header that possibly comes in from the device or system that's been provisioned, but we can combine all kinds of different characteristics of the inbound request. And I remember as a PEP, you're seeing what's on the network, what's actually coming across the wire. So that's what we utilize to basically make those determinations. But you can do other things like a, a PKI key should be mapped to a certain device and therefore, and that's one of the things I'll, I'll show in our fingerprint demo, that it's not just the PKI credential itself. We're going to lock it down further and say it's got to come from, uh, you know, this system uh, uh, specifically, or it's not allowed. So those types of things from a classification perspective are easily possible, so that we can have different levels of security applied um, uh, accordingly. Uh, similarly, uh, the you know uh, geolocation. So in the first use case, I'm going to show a geo lookup. Uh, that's uh, an integration that I'll, I'll demo. Uh, block and quarantine is part of that IDP uh, action. So you can base on uh, certain the conditions that occur, what actions you want to take. And those include the actions of uh, block um, uh, quarantine. Um, so I'm gonna show that actually under our actions for IDP. Um, so under actions here, we can have various types of actions that are applied to the conditions that are met like aborting, uh, throttling, uh, quarantining. Uh, and those, uh, and, and again, that, that, that can isolate those particular transactions that are problematic uh, without impeding the business continuity of the service and system and application. It's not just turning the entire spigot off 
it's clearly dynamically focused on turning it off for the rogue or potential risky IPs or, or users that have been detected as, as problematic. So um, that's kind of a highlight of just how this is broken down in terms of the, of the demo. Um, and um, so we'll kind of uh, tune in now, really focusing on the scenarios themselves. So scenario one is where we'll start getting into the rubber hits the road. Let's see the actual, you know, communication exchange. And this one is the uh, common mechanism, right, in the modern world of uh, cloud applications uh, that are providing capabilities uh, and, and often invoked from various places, whether it be users at home or users in the, in a, you know, in the office. Uh, but ultimately, the the communication in this case is. Uh, routinely accessing as system as a system yeah, standard user, but occasionally switching to administrator mode. Uh, and the user's physical location changes frequently with personal travel. So to demonstrate this, what I'm gonna uh, what we'll showcase is the policies. We'll do an IP source geo lookup. Uh, got a simulated cloud application uh, and we'll it'll authenticate with different user credentials to show the um, how the roles can change based on a, a standard user and a an administrator or privileged user. So the flow is going to look like this. I'm going to walk through uh, each step so that it's kind of more clear how a pet works uh, in terms of its uh, sort of each of the steps. Uh, we're going to do various uh, of the security principles and identity principles and, 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 and audit principles and, as shown in red there uh, and, and the steps that we're going to walk through. Uh, I've kind of broken down so we can see it more applicably, and then uh, we'll, we'll walk through it in the actual live. So what's the first thing that happens is the client makes that request out um, to the application in order to, um, you know, retrieve information. So that's our first step. We'll take a and shift over here and bring up the first thing I've, what I've done for demonstration purposes is I've, I've added a direct link straight to the, you know, the simulated application. Now, of course, in, 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 in practice with ZT uh, architecture, you're not going to allow access directly to the service. You're going to force it through the PEP. That's how uh, all your architecture designs work when you have policy enforcement points. You, don't, is that you only allow the communication from the policy enforcement point to the application. But for the purposes of demonstration, it's it, uh, it'll be interesting to see here because effectively this is just a a landing page that it's kind of representative of an endpoint application in the, uh, in the cloud that uh, has a couple of different fields you see at the top there, a username, auth method, source, source geo clearance, logged in and cookie that are all blank. So they're blank because not, there's no information you know uh, on the back end system that it can have. It doesn't have any capability of knowing any of these things. It doesn't have an authenticator. Doesn't know how to pull out a source IP. It doesn't have any of these technologies. It's just a cloud application. So what we're going to show is what happens when we we put that through our policy enforcement point. Okay, and going back here we'll see that ultimately what does happen is, so, so we're gonna have our, our API to, for abstraction, this will be the endpoint. A lot of times in PEP world, all you do is change your IP address uh, or fully qualified domain name or VIP on a load balancer. There's nothing that ever changes on the client. Uh, so only for the purposes of demonstration here would this uh, is the reason I have a, a different URL for the PEP, but ultimately this would just be taking the exact URL and having it be a different, uh, the PEPs is your, is, your, is your IP endpoint. It's seamless, the client never knows it's there, that's the entire intent, and that's normally how you deploy is just changing your DNS entry or your VIP uh, IP, and that becomes the, 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 the endpoint from every client's perspective. But what is that endpoint doing? So Sentry's gonna accept that request, it's gonna do a source lookup of the IP, uh, geo lookup, uh, check for the HCB protocol conformance. So this constraints align with the expectations of a cloud application, uh, the conformance for a service level agreement, for size, rates. Uh, and the most important thing is as that request is, 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 is made, is the user authenticated? Uh, do we have an authenticated known user in order to allow that access and check in the user? If not authenticated, the request is redirected to the authentication adapter that we've defined. And um, of course, that's our first step of authenticating. On subsequent requests, we'll check to see whether that authentication is there. And if so, we will perform 
policy checks. Okay, so that's the first piece of the puzzle. So we're going to see the, uh, the, the piece here as we go to the demo, what actually is happening in the, the, the application is actually going to see that the first request doesn't have an authenticated user. So it's going to redirect to an authentication page where we can then, uh, 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 we'll stop there and kind of look up at that point what, what has happened. So, um, so now I've got this uh, uh, URL here, if you can see it, it's the, the, the HR demo PEP landing page, PHP. Um, we'll go to our Sentry logs to, so we can kind of track this through our, uh, our logging to see, you know, uh, again, rubber hits the road, what's happening here, right? Um, so I'll just clear it out so we have kind of a nice clean slate here to start from. And we'll go ahead as our client and, and attempt to access uh, our application through um, that, uh, that, that location. Now you'll notice that the URL has changed because we've been redirected to a login page from our attempted access to the actual page. So let's see what has happened here. We can see basically that the user has come in and attempted to access the page. It has been redirected. Um, so we can look at each of these communication exchanges in more detail. Here's the inbound SSL handshake. Here's the inbound request that the client has made uh, to this particular page uh, for this IP. And we've gone, gone ahead and detected that we have no authenticated user. And so are redirecting this to uh, a login page. How's that all work? Well, under our policies here that I showed you earlier, this, uh, this root landing page is the default handler for when a request comes in. And this request that comes in on the specific listener policy with the specific constraints uh, around uh, the allowable methods and protocol templates has also a requirement around authentication. And the authentication requires that a user have been uh, provided and authenticated. And if not, we invoke what's called this redirect policy. And what this redirect policy says is, hey, if I get a, a request that has no authentication or a failed authentication, we're going to redirect and enforce that that login happens. Again, this redirect could be to a, a different provider like an Okta uh, or, or any other MFA provider for that matter. It doesn't have to be a Sentry provided capability. Uh, we're going to showcase here as a Sentry provided capability, but uh, certainly can extend to any authentication authenticators that you have uh, or, or in your uh, environment. Uh, and it can be different ones based on, again, kind of the location of where our customers or clients coming in from. Uh, so, so ultimately that then dictates what we have seen with regard to um, our redirect policy. And then, uh, and then the, the next piece of that was the access request here that, uh, that gives and feeds the login page. Again, all these logs are with session identifiers uniquely, so we can see the transactions. I've, of course, got, you know, debug logging on here. All this logging is fully granular in terms of how much detail or little detail you want to be able to have. Um, you can obfuscate information, everything as a log identifier, so you can create custom logging schemes, and it can be done per policy. And obviously, all this can be pushed out and commonly is to uh, SIEM systems for aggregated logging across all your PEPs. But ultimately here, we're going to see now that we've been redirected to a login page uh, that has been passed back. That's what the client gets back is that login page information uh, with, that, with that data. Uh, and that's the login page information here, text HTML. And that's essentially what the client sees. So again, pretty from a client perspective, uh, really all that's happened is, you know, attempted to go to its page and it sees a login page. This is what you're going to see. We do a lot of work for mobile banking and online banking and all these types of authentication scenarios. This is what you see, right? You try to go to Bank of America, you go to login page. Well, this is actually what's happening under the hood uh, to, to places like that. Um, so uh, here, obviously, the intent is now to use uh, we've got you know various uh, you know capabilities uh, possible for using our uh, different authenticators to authenticate and, and again based upon that you may have higher or lower thresholds of uh, you know classified security and provisions to do based on you know which login adapter you, you choose to enable these are just examples of course put together by us as a demo uh, fully extensible these aren't like this isn't like a default thing. this is fully customizable to the 
uh, adapters in, in question. But for the purposes of this, what we'll showcase is I do have an LDAP browser here that uh, connects to our uh, uh, LDAP system uh, to showcase how this works. Sentry has a policy, an LDAP policy that also points to this and a user access control list that also points to this in regard to how to authenticate this user. Um, so you'll see here under my OU users, I've got two users. I've got test user one and test user two. And I'm using um, sort of a arbitrary uh, uh, mechanism within LDAP uh, attribute called title, where I'll store uh, an attribute called uh, uh, that title uh, attribute will be normal and privileged to kind of showcase the difference between logging in as an admin or logging in as a normal user per, again, this use case. So in Sentry, this works. Uh, so this login is actually pointed back to this Sentry policy uh, over here uh, from our LDAP authentication adapter. So for when we click that login button, it's gonna come uh, here to be serviced and processed. So what are we doing? We're gonna extract out of that information, the login information uh, through our uh, form post auth processor here. Um, doing two things uh, I'm doing in conjunction with that, we're gonna do an IP to geo lookup so that we can see where the source IP of this user is coming from. How we do that is we basically take, again, through all the fact that we can grab all kinds of different aspects of the inbound request, basically everything you could imagine grabbing, right? You have access to header information, X509 attributes, uh, LDAP attributes, request path, query string parameters. In this case, we're gonna take our source IP and store it in a, what we call a user attribute. So we're storing with that user, the source IP that the user is authenticating with. And then we're gonna take that uh, information and send it off to a geo service. Uh, this geo service basically will take the IP, map it to a request API, make the call out to the geo service, and then extract the country code from the response. And that gives us our ability to map and find out whether where where this uh, geolocation of this IP is. Um, so that's that's the first piece of uh, of what happens from from that authentication policy, and then we're actually going to process the authentication itself through the SSO provisions, which is to go ahead and and and, and, and gather up the credentials that are coming in from that uh, authentication page, that post, and we're going to basically call now our access control policy, which defines which users are allowable to be authenticated uh, to, uh, to the uh, system and server. And then we're going to, uh, when we connect to our LDAP server through this identity and access control, so I'll quickly kind of show you how that works. So our, um, our user access control list here uh, defines which uh, authentication mechanism. So this is where you can also, and many of our customers use Sentry to aggregate different authenticators in one. So this credential set, you could actually have, we do customers that have forests of AD and different LDAP servers and databases and, 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 and even uh, uh, different providers that can provide login authenticators for uh, vendor specific. And all of that can be aggregated under each uh, access control so that you can go across all of them, but unify it so that it's all abstracted from the user simply. In this case, of course, we got, we got one LDAP server and this points uh, to the exact same LDAP server that we saw over here in our LDAP browser. We're looking at the OU users piece. If you guys have ever seen LDAP before, it works as a hierarchical system. So basically we're, we're look under a particular root DN for the users to find out how to bind and verify the uh, password. And again, that's constrained to the user access control list of which, uh, uh, of which I have one LDAP server, but again, I could have many. And that all again, aligns back up with our policy that authenticates against that uh, LDAP policy to then uh, do a couple of other interesting things, which is not only verify the username and password is correct, but we're also gonna go and peel out that title attribute uh, and set it to what we're gonna call user attribute clearance for the purpose of this demonstration. Uh, and then furthermore, what we're gonna do is we're gonna map this information that we now know based on this path that we've taken in, uh, through this uh, task list uh, flow, that it's an LDAP authentication. 
we're going to put go ahead and map the name, uh, the password, and the geo to what we call an identity attribute. That way it's cached for continuous authentication. Each request to this web application subsequent to that initial authentication will maintain these metadata properties of the user. This is the key to continuous authentication that you don't just arbitrarily let one access through and never authenticate again. These things will be now stored with the session of the user uh, and, and, uh, and mapped in uh, and ultimately then uh, redirected to the site in question. So what then happens is uh, after that authentication, uh, we'll do the next step of the sequence, which is actually perform our authentication. So let's go back to our access log here. We'll go back to our actual page and we'll do our login. So now we're added our credentials, our test user one with our password, and we'll go ahead and do our login. Now we get access to our web application. Again, <laughs> pretty quick uninteresting to the client, frictionless as possible. Client didn't have to do anything except for enter a password, a username password, of course, and the service doesn't have any capabilities, it's just uh, there. But what we're seeing now is this information that was empty before is now filled in. We're being told at the web application that it's a test user, that the authentication method was by password, that it's source IP, and source geo is from the USA. If clearance level is normal, it was an LDAP authentication and the session identifier of that user uh, is showcased there. How does all that get there? Well, if we go back now to our um, uh, actual um, looking at what, what happens here, is here's where that LDAP authentication happens and here's where then we get our actual next phase, which is redirected to the landing page. And in here, you'll see now that we have our request that has come in from that authentication to the actual request page that we started with, a couple of interesting things happen. Now we have an authenticated user uh, and we can go ahead and identify that, that test user one that was in our LDAP. Uh, and, and, and basically now those mappings that we saw, we're gonna map in to our request header so that we can send, we can not only make policy decisions at the PEP, but we can also send important information about that PEP's processed information so that it's useful to that application should it need it. What is it? Maybe it wants to know what the upstream authenticated user and the mechanisms are so it can build, you know, certain logic and criteria around what it serves. In the mobile banking world, of course, it dictates what is actually provided back in the interface. So if you're a business user or a, uh, a personal user, you're going to get a different uh, uh, actual uh, information uh, back in, 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 your, in your portal. So ultimately, all this mapping uh, is then uh, sent to the back end server. And you'll see here that we're sending and mapping in all of those headers to the app, the cloud application. So now that cloud application gets to see uh, important information about what uh, the upstream policy enforcement point or client, according to it, because all it is is a client that it thinks it's accessing and responding to. And then uh, that's what ultimately allows us to show um, the, uh, the page here. Similarly, if we go to another page or another aspect of this application, uh, we're going to see that that information is still there. We did not have to re-authenticate. Continuous authentication. That, that click just there to a su subsequent uh, page does actually under the hood uh, still has another access request to this page too that goes through all the same mechanisms. We're still authenticating. We're still validating that session. We're still mapping those cached aspects. So you still know who the user is because it's now a authenticated session uh, that, that is still um, there and present. Uh, so continuous authentication, enforcement of various criteria, but also the ability to present to the backend applications important information about the upstream PEP uh, enforcement point uh, uh, applied capability. Hey, Jason, Steve, just wanted to jump in real quick and say we're about five minutes from target endpoint. Kirsten indicated that we could go a little bit long there is one question from Joe Klein from MITRE about IPv6. I just wanted to check in with you for where you're at on your timeline. Uh, probably about 10 minutes. Okay, Kirsten, does that work? That works. Okay, thanks. 
Okay, so um, so if we go back to our uh, page one and show, uh, basically, I have a logout mechanism here. So let's say we want to go ahead and invalidate and log out. So now we're basically back to where we want to change to that second portion of the demonstration, which is um, that uh, that that we basically uh, want to have. Uh, so we got our logout process here. We've invalidated the session, which creates our uh, back here. So now we're going to go test two. Uh, and if you recall, test two is our LDAP user over here uh, that has a privileged versus a normal. So now our cloud application is accessed. Uh, we'll go through the same sequence and pretty much everything the same, of course, with the exception that our clearance level is now set to privileged because we have extracted the role information from the user and now are accessing as a administrative or privileged user to that cloud application. Um, so that is uh, uh, use case one, okay? So I know in the interest of time as we're going along here, so, so scenario, keep in mind, so scenarios five through eight are almost identical. And so I'll be able to go through them very quickly. That's why uh, we, we, we should only need uh, about 10 more minutes. Um, so scenario five represents an agency system often uh, accessing a fingerprint uh, uh, information. And uh, it, you know, it, there's various scenarios in here around where it's coming from in terms of the source and base system. So scenario five has them both in the cloud. You know, scenario seven has basically a source on-prem and the, the application in the cloud, verse, vice versa in scenario eight. So very similar in nature, I'll show two of the scenarios as they uh, apply and it's applicable across all of them as far as how to enforce different uh, mechanisms of authentication uh, for this. So to demonstrate this, now I have um, a uh, client simulation and a server simulation up and running uh, called basically our fingerprint client. Um, this is our API simulator that can basically inject any traffic pattern on the wire and validate uh, the information exchange. And I've got a, a sample fingerprint service here that will accept uh, requests. And, and effectively the uh, policy here is uh, get fingerprint. And what it will do is on the inbound request, send a response back, which is a uh, NIST biometric uh, uh, fingerprint package uh, with a, you know, specifically it'll set the date and time. So we know it's live actual response is not like any static. Um, so this is a simulator for the endpoint get fingerprint and the actual agency client request. The policy that will now apply in Sentry here uh, does several uh, things. So our policy here is now uh, for get fingerprint. We have two of them that will both support access to the same exact fingerprint service, but provide two layers of security uh, different based on you know where we're coming from. Uh, the first simple case is uh, a get fingerprint here where we're requiring a two-way authentication uh, to uh, using a PKI credential. So we're going to enforce this uh, through our inbound uh, HTTPS listener that uh, has a termination policy for SSL uh, with one of our test DOD JITC uh, uh, authentications. And this, what this does is it not only will it terminate, it will authenticate the client and force a PKI authentication, and also map that to a required user. So it's not only going to just allow it from the device, it's going to make sure it's the PKI credential maps to the uh, trust chain, as well as to a user access control list here, um, where we have set up uh, agency fingerprint client one with the DN of that uh, PKI credential so that it marries to a user. And we'll use this furthermore to validate the flow of allowing this to the fingerprint service or not uh, based upon uh, additional criteria, which is verifying from a trusted source. So it's also gonna process this API <coughs> credential and look up uh, where it came from, the allowable source network, source IP, and verify the, the user information. So let's walk through the flow. Uh, showcase this again. I'll do the same thing as I did before. Let's go just directly to the service to show that it is in fact coming back uh, with a, a fingerprint response, right? Um, and that does not go through Sentry. That just goes directly to the, the fingerprint service, which wouldn't be the case normally just for demonstration purposes. This is the inbound request. 
This is the uh, biometric signature response and the header information that comes in. Now we'll go through the PEP to do this, the secure PEP to actually uh, enforce this. And uh, in our response here, you'll see it's empty as currently. We're going to go through our demo ATAR PEP, uh, same uh, location. Uh, but what we have to have and provide here is an SSL certificate. We've got to provide this PKI token to authenticate uh, at that two-way SSL. And so we'll do that. Uh, we'll send in the information and we should receive a response, uh, which is our PKI credential uh, information. Now, what you're going to notice slightly different here is there's encrypted data where other where before it was uh, the actual fingerprint record because I've added dynamic response encryption to this flow as a demonstration of the capabilities of the PEP, not only to provide uh, access control and data security, but also provide dy dynamic data security uh, on the response processing. So if we look here at our uh, policy set for Get Fingerprint, first let's have a look at the log so you can actually see the flow of what happened. Here's our now new uh, flow for Get Fingerprint up here. This session identifier represents the transaction flow. Here's our SSL certificates that the client used to actually build a valid certificate path to give us our certified SSL TLS authentication and PKI credential. We've also taken that DN and mapped it to that allowable user so that it's not only just an, uh, any PKI uh, uh, issued by those uh, CAs, but distinctly the one we've defined as allowable. And then subsequently the classification of those PKI information against the source IP of the, of the client to ensure that it lines up from the expected network. So all of those constraints being met, we then can send that uh, request to the backend server. You can see this case in the second case that the actual request here will show that it's from uh, Sentry uh, instead of from um, the, 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 the original simulator. And furthermore, on the response, we're now doing a, a processing on the response document. So here you'll see that we're actually doing an encryption process on the response. If you go back to our policy here, you'll see that we not only put uh, transaction processing capability on the request, we've also got response processing that we're going to go ahead and take that document and do a, a taskless processing called uh, in, encrypt elements and encrypt elements. We've got a dynamic encryption policy here, which I'll show you in a moment, but basically does an XML encryption to encrypt the content. And we're going to isolate this image record here and encrypt it using the information of the user's key. So if I click here, I've got many different ways to encrypt symmetric, asymmetric, pretty much every digest algorithm, every key wrap algorithm to support whatever scenario of encryption pretty much that exists out there. In this case, what I'm going to do is dynamic encryption just to showcase that we're not only using that PKI credential for authentication, we're actually going to encrypt the data response using the certificate from that PKI authenticated user. And that's exactly what happens is this uh, encryption now that has come back here uh, shows that it was uh, from that uh, same PKI token that I used on my authentication request. Now, just to extend this to the second aspect of this use case, as far as if we're going to come from an environment uh, different, uh, like a, let's say now we want to add an additional layer of authentication, two-factor security and role information on uh, top for when this fingerprint maybe uh, is in an insecure location and we or it's coming from an insecure location, we can add an additional layer of security to enforce. And so the same exact fingerprint service that we've been talking about, I'm not going to change anything. What we're going to change is the mechanism of our access from an API perspective to that policy, from the policy enforcement point. So now I have another policy called uh, SAML, SAML DSIG, uh, which again, goes to the exact same URI. It's just a different way to get there through an enforced uh, API. And you can have as many of these as you need to support the different levels and uh, of characteristics, uh, security and, and, and vetting that you want. In this case, now I've got an authenticate and authorize SAML requirement 
which will uh, invoke this task list, which then puts me to my uh, identity and access control task. In this case, I'm saying I require a signed SAML token from this issuer uh, to uh, and verified through this signature digital signature verification in order to uh, authenticate this user. To simulate that, we go to our um, client simulator here, which has uh, as our uh, task processing. Uh, this SAML token generator. And in this SAML token generator, I'm generating this variant of the client from this issuer, uh, signing it with uh, 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 the same DOD PKI key that I used a moment ago. And so when we uh, invoke this, no response at the moment, we're going to go ahead and process this. We're going to see our response similarly comes it's encrypted dynamically as we've got that as a provision. Don't have to have it. We can remove that, but it's just something to showcase from a demonstration perspective. And if we look here on our simulator, we're going to see another request has come in for the for, for, from, from information. Now, uh, in, in Sentry, uh, basically this is showcased through the uh, access logs here. Now you can see we've hit a different policy, SAML DSIG response dynamic encryption. And here... It's going to show the process of this workflow, which is I've still got my handshake, my request document. We're going to take our SAML. We're going to do a digital signature verification of that SAML to ensure the authenticity of that SAML uh, and, uh, and, and further on from there. Now, let's say uh, as far as the one other variant of this, which is the scenario nine, which says use all of these scenarios but from the perspective of the agency system being accessed. It's very similar to the cloud application case where we can provide information about the upstream authentication and vetting that occurred. So that fingerprint application can see what, uh, what of that information uh, may be interesting to pass forward. And uh, very simply done, we could just go to our policy and say um, that we want to extend this concept of uh, SAML assertion here and do, uh, do something uh, additional, which is that we want to uh, map headers and attributes here. We're going to map the clearance indicator that came in from the SAM, uh, SAML assertion to the request header, okay? So for this, we simply, I had this set up before, so I'm simply gonna enable this task so that we are actually taking the clearance. And what I'm gonna do over here in my client is actually add a clearance indicator to our SAML assertion so that we now are passing an attribute in to our SAML assertion uh, called clearance of you know, whatever value. And then we can extract that as a uh, signed asserted uh, role from the SAML assertion. Again, this often comes in from a multi-factor auth uh, uh, adapter or uh, you know, a, a, what can be provided uh, by the client. And when we invoke this, now we're going to see one additional provision that happened uh, in the throughput of this, which is not only did we uh, make all these requests, but you'll notice that we're also uh, adding this clearance attribute here so that the backend server, which previously did not have that information, now has uh, an additional header that indicates what actual clearance that user has. And of course, this can align with all of those other things like the geo lookup and uh, uh, you know, other information that we showed in the, in the first part of this um, relative to um, uh, passing additional information. But that's the key to the PEP is that we can add additional information that the back end system can utilize if it chooses to or have without any effort, any work, any adapters, any coding, nothing, just mere policy design uh, at the PEP enforcement point. All right, so I know I've gone a bit over. I'm sorry, I've definitely tried to practice this timing. It's a lot of stuff to get in. So what I'll do is, uh, you know, the, the, the remaining cases here that were for discussion were really just to focus on some of the 
characteristics of how our uh, logging and auditing can uh, really assist in diagnostics of uh, connectivity issues and other things. We've got an onboard packet capture mechanism, all of that audit logging and all this information you can really showcase and hone in on diagnostics of where an issue occurred because it gives that granular visibility uh, in terms of seeing that. And, um, and the packet capture mechanism directly on board allows you to, you know, again, more easily diagnose networking issues simply uh, through this. You don't have to go, you know, do a network port mirror or anything like that. It's all uh, built into the application. So greatly simplifies the effort of troubleshooting and, and determining where errors or issues occurred. Similarly, uh, auditing and, and, and access auditing, seeing all of this information contextualized, if some authorized access happened under the CTA uh, architecture, you can instantly go back and see exactly what was accessed, exactly when it was accessed, all of the information of consequence provided to you uh, through our contextualized logging. And uh, in those penetration exercises and everything, similarly, because you have the full auditability of what was rejected and accepted and passed through, uh, it gives you uh, everything you need to see what was allowed, what wasn't allowed, where the clients went, where they didn't go. Uh, um, unparalleled visibility, uh, not only from a troubleshooting perspective, but from an audit perspective. Hey, Jason, All right, so thank apologies you. for going a bit over. I appreciate everybody's, uh, you know, uh, uh, patience with that. But now uh, let's go ahead and uh, open the floor to any any questions or anything further I can uh, help uh, uh, discuss in, in, in more detail. Hey, Jason, we got two teed up. Uh, start real quick with uh, Darren from U.S. Patent and Trademark Office is asking, uh, have you ever encountered problems with disparate PKI solutions when using their message digest functions to pass data? So one of the very chat, yes. So yes is the answer. So we we are uh, a PKI uh, offloading engine and ha have over the seasoning of literally eighteen years in critical path of industry have hit every vendor implementation differentiator of their interpretation of Oasis and W three three C specs and the the varying implications therein. And so what the um, what you'll see in our PKI engine is a very versatile set of capabilities around um, encryption uh, signatures from an algorithm standpoint, from a key wrap algorithm standpoint, from an ability to go across those. Um, there's also another um, important uh, piece of this, which is even more extensible uh, in our task list, which I'll show, which is our, um, uh, uh, let me just bring this up here and give you a little more context to our, um, uh, let's see, where is it here? Um, convert value, yeah, convert value. So here we have the digest algorithms across, uh, you know, pretty much all your variants of SHA-1 and SHA-2, different encoding key wraps. So to your point, uh, what you'll find is an incredible disparity of vendor-specific uh, implementations of, of hash digests and, and information exchanges there. And in the REST world, of course, most of your uh, security is more hash-based than kind of traditional signature-based. So it is absolutely a unifying entity to be able to integrate with virtually all these vendor specific stacks that have their unique flavors of security implementations. Um, so in the cases of what I mentioned before, uh, if you can think about even like the IRS case, there's over 2,000 different application APIs that come in, and every one of those has a different implementation. In the TSIS case, they integrate with all these different banking infrastructures, like thousands of banks, and every one of them has their own stack that may be capable or not capable of adhering to the you know more rigid standards of SHA-2 hashes and 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 and, and, and RSA requirements. And so we have to uh, uh, provide the capability to our customers to allow them to do uh, discrete integrations with these either less capable vendors or, or customers through those variants that you know uh, around ha hashing uh, uh, algorithms and other either limitations or different uh, variants of uh, implementation around these encryption and security standards. It's something we've done for near two decades. It's a big uh, issue if you're trying to tie vendor-specific technology directly together. 
that's why we provide that abstraction layer to greatly, greatly simplify that effort. Thanks for the question, Darren. If you could let me know in the chat if you had any clarifications on that. I want to go to Joe Klein from MITRE. Uh, and Jason, just for situational awareness, uh, Tim Schmoyer from MITRE is also on, <clears throat> presented to Tim's uh, ICAM working group last year. And just asking for some clarification around IPv6 and looking at uh, the, the federal government's requirement to uh, implement IPv6 and, and just wanting to understand a little bit more about, you know, do we really have IPv, IPv6 capabilities in here? Uh, a lot of vendors out there claim it. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we, this is a requirement to be on the IRS network. So IRS is a customer internal, uh, external FAA, same thing. Uh, you, so a lot, UK government IPv6. So, so very prom IPv6 has been prominent for, for some, this has been a capability for several years, uh, in the product technology. So absolutely, uh, it's, it, you have the ability to actually switch modes to pure IPv6 in general. We, our customers have hybrid models because they have to support uh, both IPv4 and IPv6 infrastructure simultaneously. Um, so yeah, IPv6 uh, uh, routing, DNS uh, 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 endpoints, uh, you know, for listeners uh, for, 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 from from the networking policies uh, perspective, you can these listener addresses that I use are IPv6, but you can just as easily put IP uh, or before I should say you could easily put IPv6 uh, uh, addresses in here. So fully supported IPv6, we've been compliant for, I think, probably five, six years now, uh, as required really by these government agencies and, and entities that have, have their own requirements to, for, for uh, conformance to uh, v4 and v6. The beauty for us is we provide you a mechanism of bridging the gap because in many cases of this legacy technology issues of modernization, you can't just enforce IPv6 on everything because just those things just can't do it. Well, we can do it on behalf. So that scenario I described earlier around the abstraction is you can have IPv6 on the front side and IPv4 on the back for a policy. So your listener policy here could be IPv6 and your remote policy can be IPv4 to allow communication to a legacy application, but present it as an IPv6 capable networking uh, uh, capability. So absolutely uh, fully supported in, 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 in you know, pure IPv6 mode, uh, but more common in hybrid supporting both IPv4 and v6 uh, simultaneously. Hey, Joe, we can either follow up offline or if you wanted to clarify your question, uh, you can come off mute and ask it. Oh, um, we found a trend with uh, over the last 15 years of companies that made claims that they supported IPv6, uh, but they don't even have it on their own website. Um, I'm just trying to uh, synchronize that because we've seen major companies claim it, but then actually not implement it. Uh, I'm, yeah, just, I, I'm just asking if you're because you know you would think that you're using your own product on your own infrastructure and it would also be supporting ipv6 so that it was in alignment with yep. you know showing people you were using it but that's it yeah no absolutely and uh yeah, we're definitely not in the business of making claims of things we don't support so for sure uh put us to the test for all of that uh we, ipv6 is a prominent in uh many uh, i would say most of our customer deployments right now uh, in both government uh, and commercial spaces and, you know, happy to demonstrate anything you'd like to see in that uh, arena uh, as further proof. Okay, Thanks, Joe. Do we have any other questions? Kirsten, I don't see any more in the chat. Um, and unless somebody uh, raises a hand or comes off mute and asks, I think we've fielded them all. All right, excellent. Um, I'm going to hit stop record then real quick.